Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to share with you some of our experiences. I will talk in this presentation about uh, the importance of nanoelectronics, um, also in, its, uh, in, its, in the context of, uh, of how it can address some of the key societal challenges we're facing. And I would like to then talk about how to um, uh, move towards a European innovation engine in this uh, field. I think we all realize, and it is being recognized also in the Key Enabling Technology Initiative, that nanoelectronics is indeed a key enabling technology, very important for the future of Europe. I think we all realize that we are living in a world with limited resources. And uh, especially the way how we live creates quite some challenges. Challenges uh, such as uh, global warming, aging society, urbanization, mobility. Many of these challenges are indeed jeopardizing the sustainability of our future. However, we are convinced that nanotechnology, nanoelectronics can contribute to addressing some of these key societal challenges. I think we all realize that uh, nanoelectronics has created this revolution in the domain of ICT, the domain which we classically associate as ICT, uh, through uh, the, the phenomenal evolution of, uh, of mobile computing, mobile communication. But we are convinced that nanoelectronics can also bring innovation into so many other sectors, enlarging, enlarging the, the span of, of ICT, of what we classically call ICT. Indeed, if you look at mobility, the auto automotive industry, today the value that is represented by the electronics is on, in our cars is higher than the value represented by the mechanics. In the domain of energy, semiconductor can bring a lot of innovation in terms of energy generation through solar power, but also energy saving, energy storage, uh, energy switching, power electronics. All of these uh, technologies are uh, key requirements for uh, implementing the smart grid. But one of the areas where we believe that, uh, that nanoelectronics can really create a, a revolution is this domain of healthcare. I think we all realize that we're living in this aging society and the pressure on a healthcare system is going to be tremendous. To keep the cost under control is going to be a tremendous challenge. And, and here, again, we believe that electronics, nanoelectronics, nanotechnology can indeed contribute to providing uh, improved uh, diagnostics, more precise mon uh, monitoring, which are the key uh, technologies that are needed in order to realize this vision that we refer to as the four Ps in, in, in sustainable healthcare, more preventive, more par participative, uh, more predictive, and more, uh, uh, these four Ps, uh, preventive, predictive, participative, uh, and um, I forgot the fourth one, <laughs> um, uh, medical uh, treatments. So um, electronics is going to be essential to, to realize this. Uh, indeed, the opportunities are kind of endless, uh, and many of those are indeed addressing these societal challenges which I was uh, referred to, all realized by the progress in semiconductor technology. Um, in order to secure uh, our position uh, of Europe in the future, it will be essential, therefore, to set up a very effective nanoelectronics innovation engine that can fuel innovation into many of those sectors which are really essential for the future of Europe, uh, sectors such as communication, automotive, healthcare, pharma, uh, and energy, and probably many more. Which brings me to the second topic uh, of my presentation uh, on how to stimulate innovation in this domain. And when we, we think about innovation and how it has been uh, created over the last 20 or 30 years, then we come from a time where the, where the innovation was kind of created in a very linear way, from research, pioneering research, over development to entry into manufacturing. And a lot of the pioneering concepts, like the invention of the transistor, were, were done in these big corporate labs uh, as part of big corporate uh, organizations, typically in a fully captive model. And we all know many of these uh, uh, large uh, uh, R&D uh, groups, uh, like Bell Labs, IBM Yorktown, 
Um, here in Europe, we had Philips Natlab, um, many of these big Japanese corporate organizations. But as we all know, many of those have reduced in size or some of them have completely disappeared. And the reason for it is clear that such a captive model for, especially for the generic part of the R&D, is, is not affordable anymore. The cost of developing these new technologies is becoming so high that, that even the biggest companies in this world, uh, uh, even companies like Intel, are saying, well, we, we can't do all this R&D on our own. We have to rely on a distributed R&D model. So it clearly has become unaffordable to do it in a captive model. It's also not the most effective way to do innovation because more and more the challenge the challenges become so big that you have to bring together various disciplines, uh, that you have to bring together uh, expertise from very different domains, uh, like from biotechnology, electronics, certainly for all these new applications, and it's impossible to do that in, in a captive mode. So therefore, this model clearly has become uh, outdated, and there is a very big trend, uh, certainly in our sector, to go to a model which is much more open, an open innovation model, and that's what we have been pioneering uh, at IMIC uh, for the last uh, 20 years. We believe that essential elements of such a model are the critical mass. Uh, in order to do meaningful research, uh, research in this field, you have to have critical mass. Uh, it has to be global. The, the industry is global, the world is flat, uh, also the innovation has to be addressed in a global way. And this is needed in order to bring together the best brains of the world. And it's also essential, as the innovation requires multiple disciplines, it is essential to bring together the full value chain, the full ecosystem. And, and one cannot uh, work on the technology without knowing the application. One cannot develop new applications if you don't have new technology. So those two have to be linked together very much. Those are the essential ingredients that we're trying to combine uh, at IMEC, and I would like to use uh, uh, a small fraction of the remaining time to introduce uh, IMEC to you as, uh, as an example of a world-class infrastructure in this uh, domain. Um, we aim to be a world-leading research uh, infrastructure for nanoelectronics, and, and we try to combine uh, the, the extensive collaboration with universities to fill the pipeline with new ideas, but with the goal to deliver industry-relevant technology solutions. And this, by using nanoelectronics in domains of ICT, but also more and more in adjacent fields uh, of healthcare and energy, as I tried to illustrate in the beginning. In order to do that, we have set up a, a state-of-the-art uh, infrastructure, of which most is located uh, in, uh, in Leuven, uh, here in Belgium. And, uh, and it consists of several clean rooms. The most advanced one is, using a, uh, is, is a clean room where we're using 300 millimeter uh, silicon wafers. And we have later generation tools for kind of all of the process steps that are required in order to make these new devices. Devices here, we're, we're talking about dimensions of transistors, individual transistors on, on such uh, devices uh, of the order of 10 nanometers and, and below. Now, in order to do that research on these state-of-the-art tools, you need uh, really a, a, a very state-of-the-art infrastructure, and the total assets that we have brought together in this clean room amount to a value of more than 1 billion euro. We're working in this infrastructure with about 2,000 people. Um, besides this uh, clean room on 300 millimeter wafers, we have another clean room where we work uh, with 200 millimeter wafers and where we are working on these uh, other, other devices such as sensors, uh, uh, MEMS devices, uh, solar cell technology, and so on. Now, there are also a lot of applications in the domain of, uh, of biomedical, as I explained uh, before. And in order to test those devices, we have also set up a state-of-the-art infrastructure for this, this characterization of those devices uh, in, in real-life uh, conditions, and where we work together in a very multidisciplinary way with uh, engineers uh, working on the nanoelectronics, biotechnology people, and even medical doctors, surgeons, uh, who work together in one, uh, one big uh, team. One of the uh, labs that we have uh, on this campus is also an exercise lab where we are uh, working, kind of doing the co-design of new architecture concepts for uh, next generation supercomputers, the software development, and we are working also with application teams uh, in order to uh, determine the next uh, requirements for next generation high performance uh, computing. And in that context, we are also part of, uh, uh, we are also a part of a flagship uh, proposal, uh, IT form, uh, which is addressing exactly those applications.
In this infrastructure, we have implemented uh, uh, an open innovation model where we are working together with all the key players active in this field, and I would say on a worldwide level. We have brought together all the industrial companies uh, uh, in, uh, active in this uh, ecosystem, going from material suppliers up to uh, semiconductor companies and uh, system companies uh, using those, uh, those new devices. And I will just show uh, the, the, the companies that are partnering with, uh, with us uh, in this uh, infrastructure. Um, basically, all of the world leaders are, are uh, working with us uh, here, and this by far represents the, the world's last, uh, largest uh, industry commitment to semiconductor research in partnership, which allows us to build up this uh, uh, world-class uh, uh, R&D infrastructure. Um, of the, it's, it's global, uh, but we are, of course, also uh, working uh, with lots of European companies uh, in this environment. About two-thirds of our partners are indeed uh, European companies. In this way, we are indeed working with all the industrial leaders in this field, uh, but uh, and it's an open innovation along the value chain, uh, but it's also, I think, an, an example of, an open of the implementation of an open innovation model along the innovation chain. We're not only working with all the industrial companies, but also with uh, uh, nearly all of the academic uh, players uh, active in this domain. We indeed have more than 200 uh, universities with whom we are participating, with whom we are collaborating uh, on these uh, topics, and many of those are sending um, students, PhD students, to use uh, the infrastructure. We have more than 200 PhD students uh, among our staff coming from these universities, and obviously we are working with nearly all of the European universities in this field. In fact, two, uh, three quarters of, the, of our partners on the university side are European universities. In this way, we believe that we are an example of, of how we can indeed bridge this value of that which is very often referred to in the European context on how to transfer research results into real industrial innovation. So in this context, IMEC is really trying to, uh, to implement this model of open innovation in, the, in, in, I think, one of the world's most advanced uh, infrastructures in this domain by bringing together all the key players along the value chain, along the innovation chain, uh, but also across countries, across uh, uh, continents, uh, and working on, on a global scale. In this context, as I said, we're not only working with uh, all of the European uh, leaders in, uh, in this field, but we are also attracting all of the top uh, companies and universities from all over the world to come to Europe uh, I I to do some of this uh, most uh, advanced uh, research. And our model is such that all the IP that we built up, that we can also locally deploy that IP. So this is, we believe, a very strong asset for Europe. Now, having said that uh, nanoelectronics is a key enabling technology, it's important for the future of Europe. Uh, it is also important, therefore, that we make sure that we can maintain such a kind of uh, leadership position and that we, we ensure that we do have leading edge infrastructure for nanoelectronics also five to ten years from now. In this context, uh, uh, there is going to be a trend that the latest technology will be developed on the next generation wafer size, which uh, will be 450 millimeter uh, wafers. And so therefore, we are convinced that it is going to be essential for Europe also to have uh, access to that technology and build up a research infrastructure using the latest generation equipment. Uh, and we have uh, uh, prepared a plan uh, to indeed uh, uh, realize uh, such, uh, uh, build up such an infrastructure over the next uh, uh, five to six years. Uh, and we have uh, kind of all the plans in place uh, for that. This will uh, ensure the, the availability of a state-of-the-art nanoelectronics uh, innovation uh, engine which will support the full value chain uh, and this is really uh, important uh, for Europe. It represents uh, the industry that we are serving uh, is uh, representing more than 250,000 uh, jobs in Europe, direct jobs. So if we take the typical multiplication factors, it's uh, probably more representing more than half a million jobs. One of the challenges we have in Europe is that we are living in Europe where we have, uh, where we have 27 member states and, uh, and some of the instruments that we, are, we, we have in, uh, in our European uh, research uh, uh, 
uh, funding uh, structure uh, are not always promoting uh, the cross-border collaboration. And, uh, and especially in our sector where we have the JTs and joint programming, which uh, have become quite uh, popular, what has happened is that uh, we, we've seen a, a pooling of the European funding with national funding and national funding typically being decided by the member states, the European funding is typically to used as a topping up uh, on, the on top of the national funding. Now this has a consequence that there is really no strong incentive for cross-border collaboration and, uh, and, and for using the strengths that are available in Europe. What is happening is that the European funding is basically being used to strengthen a distributed national, a distributed national subcritical initiatives, and there is really no incentive for prioritizing uh, excellence, which is one of the the prime uh, uh, criteria, which uh, which is, is felt as as a priority. So this is one of the challenges uh, we are uh, facing, uh, and which has a, has as a consequence that in Europe innovation really very often stops at the borders, and that is what we feel we should avoid. We should use European funding really as a glue to strengthen collaboration across the member states and to to strengthen supranational connectivity, and we do have several strong labs uh, in Europe. Um, uh, there are several clusters, and I think it's essential that we make sure that the European uh, uh, funding is used as an incentive to, to strengthen those clusters, but especially also to strengthen the, the collaboration and the mechanism of, uh, of um, uh, forming a, a large pan-European uh, center of excellence, uh, uh, including also the, the very strong university network we have and the other R&D institutes. I think more coordination is needed on that uh, aspect. So to conclude, uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, or reiterate that nanoelectronics indeed is a key enabling technology for Europe. Uh, we need leading edge infrastructure for nanoelectronics also five to 10 years from now. Uh, and therefore it's very essential that we have to stop thinking local stop thinking uh, in, uh, in, in terms of, of member states, uh, individual member states. We have to start thinking global, thinking the importance of Europe, um, strengthen the strengths, link the strengths that we have within Europe. We have to think long term uh, and therefore we have to take leadership. That will be the only way uh, how we can make sure that, that Europe uh, will be there uh, at the forefront of innovation uh, 10 years from now. Thank you very much.